أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين I begin in the name of Allah, most compassionate, most merciful. All praise be to Allah, Lord of the universe, and may the peace and blessings be upon the noblest of prophets and messengers, and upon his family, the good, the pure. Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is indeed a great pleasure for, be, for me to be here amongst all of you your warm and fr- friendly faces that uh, constantly draws me back, back here and uh, for giving me this opportunity to remember and share some thoughts, in fact to exchange thoughts on the life and legacy of a Sayyid al-Shaheed Muhammad Baqa Sadr and his virtuous sister a shahida Amna Sadr bint al-Huda. Now, uh, inshallah, you know, the key operative word here is to exchange because their well was so deep that I can only draw little from it. And, you know, in the limited time that we have, I can only share only so much. So it's just a salient feature that have stood out for me. And perhaps, inshallah, we can hear from everyone as to some of their thoughts and contributions that have stood up for you. Now many of us already are familiar with you know, their bi- biogra- uh, biographical sketch. So I won't go into the details of their personal histories. Those of you who don't know them, I encourage you to get to know them because they are remarkable and influential figures who have contributed you know, both in thought and action uh, towards re- reforming society uh, and their contributions have permeated throughout the region and, in fact, the world. And so, you know, it's important for us to remember them, not just as iconic figures whose posters adorn our walls, whether they be physical or virtual walls, but for us to delve into their concerns and into their objectives. And so, inshallah, this is what I hope to um, uh, share with you today. So I'd like to begin uh, before I actually uh, continue with the verse of the Quran which is appropriate for such figures where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa la tahsabanna alladhina qutilu fi sabilillahi amwata bal ahya'un anna rabbihim yurzaqun. Do not suppose those who are slain in the way of Allah to be dead. Nay, they are alive with their Lord uh, seeking sustenance or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing sustenance for them. So when we look at the life of Sayyid al-Shaheed al-Sada and we uh, analyze what is his principal concern, we find that his concern was for the individual and for society to drive, uh, to strive for the highest ideal, the absolute ideal which is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for the ideal way of life, that is Islam, to be the guiding principle of humanity. And so he gave life to the ummah, and they gave life to the ummah, even at the cost of their own. But then again, that's the path of the prophets, that's the path of the infallibles. And you know what luminous gems that we lost? I mean, this, it's just um, you know, quite incredible in terms of the sheer loss that the Ummah, that, uh, of the Ummah when their lives were cut short prematurely at their prime. I mean, can you imagine losing a child prodigy who at the age of 11 was studying and teaching and refuting philosophical ideas, whom it is said, had never made taqlid in his life because by the time that he was balagh, he was a mujtahid himself whom at an age younger than my own you know, in his mid-twenties he wrote uh, internationally acclaimed works of our philosophy 
and our economy that influenced not just thinkers but but nations you know in terms of the adoption of their ideas you know towards their setup for instance you know his work on islamic banking system was instrumental in establishing the banking system of kuwait and even in the gulf region as to how they would deal with their oil wealth his political thoughts shaped constitutions and he wrote he literally wrote the textbook on islamic jurisprudence that's used in the hauzas today you know he had such a rich insight into a vast array of fields whether it be quran or hadith jurisprudence or theology logic or philosophy history or politics economics or sociology psychology governance culture and in all of these fields he w was able to contribute immensely what an incredible mind what a beautiful mind and what a consistent mind as well whereby he took the higher principles the foundational principles and he applied it to all fields it's important for us to read his works it's important for us and, and many of them are translated into, into English and are available readily on the internet and you know at the same time he was radiant and approachable always with a smile on his face have you seen his pictures you know he's always smiling in them and yet this was the man who was the greatest threat to the tyrants and he had such a great character and high personality that you know, you know even those whom he thoroughly refuted and critiqued whether it be Marx or Descartes or Locke or Kant or Hume or Freud you know he would cordially refer to them as intelligent people he was very respectful uh, whom he strongly differed with so he disagreed without being disagreeable and this is the mark of you know a great intellect whereby those who are ignorant and those who have a weak argument re, you know basically we resolve towards character assassination and vilification he didn't vilify the person he critiqued the idea and you know you found him to be himself to be the subject of vilification both you know of amongst his own people and others as well and he was courageous he was courageous in his thoughts he was courageous in his words he was courageous in his actions and for this he was harassed he was maligned he was arrested he was tortured and ultimately paid the ultimate price with his execution you know we find that in even if you if you want to have a very quick sample of this great courage of his in terms of his uh, his stance against oppression have a look at some of his last messages which were struggle which were smuggled from uh, when he was under house arrest you know he looked the dictator eye to eye in his words and in person and in one of these messages he says I know that these demands will cost me my life uh, and but these are not the demands of an individual they are demands of a nation and such was the person of Sayyid al-Shaheed uh, not, not just also in action or words but he was very courageous in his thoughts too and where he went beyond uh, established uh, status quo uh, and had uh, an independence of mind and so we also find for instance you know where the Quran describes individuals you know the believers who are stern with those who cover the truth but compassionate amongst themselves and he was so compassionate amongst the believers you know to the nation he uh, affectionately addressed it and again these are statements coming from his last speech where he addresses it all oh, my sons or oh, the sons of Abu Bakr and Omar or oh, the sons of Ali and Hussein you know, all oh my brothers and sons who are Shia and Sunni, Arab and Kurd, 
and he addressed, he addressed with he addressed them with such affection, uh, without any sectarian or discriminatory uh, outlook. So, you know, let us immerse ourselves tonight in sampling his thoughts, uh, and particularly pertaining to his core objective. What was his core mission? What was his core theme and objective? His main objective was for humankind to fulfill their destiny as the khala'if of Allah, as the trustees of God, as the stewards of God, as the vicegerents of God, whom you know we find in uh, the verses of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنِّي جَعَلُونَ فِي الْعَرْضِ Khalifa. I am establishing on the earth a trustee, a steward, a vicegerent. Here in this verse, Khalifa is in singular form, referring to Adam, Adam, the prototypical human being. But also, we, f we find that the Qur'an refers to Khalifa in the plural form, uh, plur plural form where Allah Subh'ana says, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ خَلَائِفَ الْأَرْضِ And we have made you, plural, the vicegerents, the trustees, the stewards on earth. And so this is the destiny of humankind. But Sayyidah Shaheed also recognized that a key obstacle on that path of fulfilling that mission is the distraction by the attraction to the world. So, and when he analyzes this, he traces this key <coughs> conflict to the creational schema, you know, the creational schema of human beings, whereby on the one hand human beings have the element of being made from earth and on the other hand they have this divine spark. And he refers to the Quran whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ صَلْصَالٍ مِنْ حَمَّاءٍ مَسْنُونَ Certainly we have created man from a dry clay of aging mud. So man being created from earth. But three verses later, and this is, um, you know, almost right, you know, sequentially, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ And I have blowed, I have breathed into him of my spirit. And so, you know, we find that human beings are a combination of these two things. And I'm quoting the Sayyid where he says that, you know, in terms of the human beings, his clay origin draws him to the earth and calls him to base desires, material de tendencies, and all that is low, vile, and becoming of the earth. At the same time, the spark of the Divine Spirit breathed into him, calls him to high and noble qualities, and lifts him so much so that he comes near to the Divine qualities and adopts them. Divine Spirit invites him to Allah's endless knowledge, His endless power, his endless justice, his endless generosity and magnanimity and retribution and his other attributes and qualities. And we see this, you know, for instance, in the life of Imam Ali, how he completely annihilated himself in, you know, the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such that he became the hand through which Allah operated, the eyes through which Allah saw, you know. So this is the potentiality of human beings. And so in terms of these elemental tendencies uh, between the earthly and divine, he says that there's a conflict 